I think the community is kind of, you know, developed um, really around David because I know David started his path on his own. Just he and Jesus and travel alone and go to homes wherever he was invited and go to course groups wherever he was invited. And then when people started to go around David and saying, I want to live with you, it wasn't like David said, I want to start a spiritual community. It didn't start like that. It was people came to him saying, I'm your students. I want to learn from you. And I actually want to live with you 24-7. And people started to just, just start to form around you with properties and different things. That was the start. And I really feel that is important because, because from the very beginning, this is a very clear focus that we are not leading the way with a plan or idea of how it's going to look. Because the whole purpose is we are going to be shown this whole life on earth in time and space. If we're going to use, be, if that's going to be used to undo our entanglement or belief in time and space, we have to be shown. And we cannot really sort out the plan from within, within this realm of mind. So, so this is how it got started. David was clueless and was like, OK, a community is coming, and people are living around. And, and he just continued to travel you know, continue to travel, and certain people say, I want to travel with you. So it just started like that, and more and more people um, came to live in a base where, whether he travels away or not, they just settled there. So I think then gradually um, a monastery, uh, Living Miracles Monastery, was donated by Suzanne um, in Utah, United States. That's where the first wave of, um, of volunteers came to support. And I remember I was probably among that wave when we just got the monastery, it just opened, and I came. And it was the same. I didn't really come to, to live in community r at all. I just finished a long ret retreat with David in Australia. They all left. And I really was looking at my life and how I was not myself. I could not really follow my calling. So I was really looking at all the situations and decided to make some, make some changes. And I made the biggest change, which was I was um, going to leave my marriage because I couldn't really be truthful to myself. If we're gonna stay together, there was, so that was the biggest. But I was terrified after I made that decision. I was so terrified that I, I texted David, and he was probably still have one more day in Australia. Then he was gonna go. I texted David. I said I did this, and then he said, "Come down um, where we are, which was a few hours away from Sydney, and just be with us for a day." because they were leaving the next day. So I went down, and I felt so bad in my heart, just like the dark, dark uncertainty about what did I, what have I done, what was going to happen. Uh, at the end of the day, I just couldn't stand it. I just said, can I just spend some time with you, just a few minutes, just to sit down, because I was just trembling. And then he said, welcome to visit us in Utah. So I thought, oh, Okay, thank God, I have a next step. And I didn't come in until I made a huge move. So when, when I went to Utah, I was only thinking of three months. That's the only time I could stay in the United States, three months. And I thought, by the end of the three months, I would finish my mind training. It was, <laughs> it was just taking, you know, it's three months. Mind training, that's a long time. So that's... that's that was probably nine years ago when I came. 
so that's that's really, and I I believe that was a lot of the, you know, we were in the same situation with a lot of the people who who came together in that time. We we felt called to receive mind training. That was really the only purpose we went there for. No, it's not our life. It was it was not intention to to do anything, except just for ourselves. So gradually, I think it just continued on, continued on one thing after the next because, because Spirit kept giving me new assignments and new heart-opening and life-opening and mind-opening experiences. So I felt like I was expanding, expanding, expanding. There was nowhere else that I needed to go because I felt like even though I was living in the community, I wasn't really living in one place, I was continuously expanding and feel like the, com the community expanded with me together. So we were like a just, that's, that's the experience. But the purpose is so important because if we go to a place and feel we're gonna make something out of it in terms of goals in time and space, then that is actually the total opposite of, of awakening. And that is not gonna work. It's gonna be a huge compromise of our calling. So, so you know, you can imagine for, we have people who come from different parts of the world and at, at any given time, um, the size always varies, you know, from year to year. Sometimes we have a lot of people all of a sudden. Sometimes we have a very small group and people come from, you know, one week, one month to just indefinite. We, we, we really don't know, but it was just all orchestrated. But I do say that David kept the purpose very, very pure because it's very tempting to mix intentions and purpose. The, the moment you get into daily life, get daily living and with a group of people and we're talking about daily things, talking about projects, you know, when we do a retreat, we don't say whatever the result, you know, if it happens, it happens, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. No, when we, <laughs> when we receive the prompt to put a retreat, it is happening because there is integrity underneath it. If spirit said, this is what we're gonna put out and what we're gonna do. We take steps, very, very specific steps, and we're not like, who knows? We don't know, let's see. There is actually a difference. So, so when we come together, there, there are a lot of projects like this, daily, day in and day out. So it's all kind of feeling the same as living anywhere in the world, actually, in terms of how it looks. But the only difference, which is a huge difference, is the purpose is very, very single. And the moment temptations come up to mix the purpose and to split the purpose or change the purpose, it gets written out pretty quickly because it, it held, you know, very, very sturdy from David and from everybody's intentions. So, yeah, I, I really just feel it's, it's important. We cannot talk about spiritual communities and how we live without talking about what is truly the foundation of it. Because if we talk about what we do and how we do things, it, it's not really the message, it's not the picture. You know, the only reason that we are living together is because of the purpose. And the only reason that we seem to be able to, to continue on and advance in our spiritual awakening is because of this purpose. And this, the, the only reason that I can share with you today and all of us can have anything to share is just because of this purpose. That's really, there's nothing else to share except that. So, yeah, so having said that, then we can talk a little bit more about the specifics. 
Yeah, and I, I just also want to lay the context that when you put the purpose out front to forgive, it is like you're handing over all attention, concern, worry about outcomes in the world. We're not talking about advocating a certain way of living. When, you, when I think community, I think purpose. When I think community, I actually, th I think communion with the Holy Spirit. I think communion with Jesus is what I'm thinking of. I mean, holy communion, not taking bread and <laughs> not from the Catholic system or the, the church system, but, but being in alignment and sharing the same prayer and letting the Spirit guide. And that means giving over the concern for the form and saying, you give me, if there's a word I need to speak, you give it to me. Somebody I need to meet, I'm happy. You, you tell me how or you bring them to me. If I'm supposed to travel somewhere, then let's do it. You be you in charge. It's not about the boxes that I talked about at the beginning, categories, statuses, boxes, you know. I would, I would rather have communion with you than have a status in the world. I would rather have communion with you, Spirit, rather than be identified with a, with a country, you know. That's John Lennon again. Imagine, imagine there's no country. I wonder if you can. There, that's what the Holy Spirit was telling me the same thing that John was sharing in his song. Imagine there's no country. That's an artificial construct, you know, American and German, and Australian, you know, it's like, and languages, you know, those, those are artificial. You know, there's a language of the heart, there's a language of, of, the, of the unified mind, there's a language of the spirit, and it takes us into this divine silence where we just are perfect, you know, it's just isness. There's nothing, there's not even words in that pure beingness. So all I want to do is say, you guide my words, you guide my interactions, you guide everything, it's all yours. And that's why we are not advocating a particular form. I could not advocate a, f advocate a form when the parable of David has been filled with so many different forms. I mean, after I received A Course in Miracles in 1986, it was very intimate, but it was so intimate that I would just pop it open as like an oracle, I would pray, have a question, pop it open, get my answer, it happened over and over, month after month, and then Jesus said, I can do it with, watch, we do it with the radio too, pray, ask your question, now you're in your car, turn the radio on. Oh my God, he said no. See that sign over there? Oh, let's go to the library. You don't even need A Course in Miracles. I'll pray, ask your question, walk through the rows of the library, I'll tell you where to stop. You reach up, you pull a book open, you pop it open. Oh, oh, it was like, okay, I see, I see. You're in charge. You, I pray for the answer and you're gonna give it to me. In, in a song on the radio, in somebody speaking to me, in a billboard. I mean, it's going to come flooding into me if that's my prayer to be shown, to be guided, to be led. I don't, I'm not limited by the Course. I mean, it's going to come everywhere. And so for me, that's the purpose, and the purpose goes in line with the, with the prayer of the heart. I'm more interested in all of us praying together, and not praying together just with words, but getting in, like we're on the same channel, we're all tuned in, our, our minds are all connected to the same purpose. So it's like a dance, like we had last night. Imagine your daily life being like that dance that we experienced. So spontaneous, so just joyful, so happy. Not a care in the world. We're just swaying and moving and running and we're being, it's like played with the spirit. You know, we're just, we're just totally, to me that's what community is. That's what communion is. And, and then another line from Imagine, that song, 
Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. Well, we're not into ritualistically trying to say, okay, you, no possessions, no possessions, no. Because we know that possessions are in the mind, right? The ego is the possessive part of the mind. But if you start to trust and you start to flow and let the spirit orchestrate things, then you start to realize that everything in this world is a backdrop. I'm not advocating a certain way that people should be or a certain form because in 1991 I said, okay Jesus, what's next? And you've heard of like maybe the Aborigines in uh, Australia, Marla Morgan's book, uh, when she goes on walkabout in the, in the Aborigines. Well Jesus said, we're going to do a little drive about. And I said, okay, I don't have a car. He said, well, I'll take you to, you know, we'll go to the car dealership and uh, you've got how much money? Okay, we'll get you a little, he got me a little gold three-cylinder little, it was really good. The price of gas back in 1991 <laughs> was very cheap. And he got me a three-cylinder car, which could pretty much run on fumes. I, I very rarely had to fill the car up. I'd fill it up and then drive across states, across the United States. I could go for miles and miles and miles on this little thing. And Jesus said, yeah, we're going on a little drive about. And actually that drive about actually lasted five years. That's the thing with Jesus leading the way. You just, you know, you think you're going on a trip and it's a trip. It's a mind trip. Uh, we're going on a trip. He didn't really tell Helen Shuckman what was coming. <laughs> he didn't tell Judy. He never tells any of us where it's going because we'll get too frightened. But he just gives us little morsels like breadcrumbs. Here you go. Just follow the breadcrumbs. Yeah, that's all. Just the next breadcrumb. That's all you got to focus on. Here, the next breadcrumb. So he took me out for someone who didn't even like to travel Yeah, on a five-year trip. Uh, that really washed that one away. And then I was taken in and met these people all over. I had so many miracles. And that was the form that initially it took. After just reading the book, studying the book, using the book as an oracle, and being very devotional, I didn't even know of course groups at the beginning. I didn't even know there was such a thing as Course in Miracle groups, all I know is I was having a very deep, intimate experience with Jesus, and that was all I needed. I didn't even have to think about groups. And then when I started traveling around for five years, I met a lot of people in groups. Um, some groups welcomed me in. I went to one group, a course group, and they had a set of bylaws, and, and they had to take a vote whether I could speak at the group. And I was like, whoa. And Jesus is like, I'm teaching you to be present with me. You do not need to be concerned about rules and groups and everything like this. Stay with me. That's the goal here. Uh, don't judge anything. I was invited one year to, to a conference um, where I was going to be a speaker and the minister set up a session with the whole group where it was myself and another minister and another minister holding a stopwatch. And I was like, okay, never seen this one. Well, the, the guy, the minister with the stopwatch would give like the first person like a minute or two minutes to speak and then time and then there would be like, it was set up like a political debate except this was about spiritual awakening and enlightenment. So I remember talking, David, you can go. Somebody asked a question from the audience about enlightenment. I would get talking, 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 and then in mid-sentence. And so one of the most important things to remember as you're on your spiritual journey is ding, time. <laughs> Jesus closed my mouth on time, even if I was in mid-sentence, because that was the format that was given. And I was not to try to buck the format. I was to be there in happiness and joy 
and stay attentive. And if that was the rule that was given, then I would stop right on the s stopwatch. Well, there were some people in the audience that were quite upset, <laughs> and there was a lot of people <laughs> shaking things, all kinds of things going on. And this went on until finally I said, I know Jesus is going to have some fun with this, because uh, he always does. He's so playful. He uses anything to, to make it playful and joyful. This went on for some time. Finally, my time to speak, I was speaking, and I was speaking, and it went on in a joyful way, and the guy holding, the minister holding the stopwatch was not, was not stopping me. I was way beyond the time, until the other minister said, hey, 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 what's going on here? David is way over time. He interrupted the whole thing. This is not great. You know, what's going on? And then the minister, with the stopwatch, said, I know. David mentioned my name in his answer. I felt to give him as long as he wanted to speak. <laughs> with a total straight face, <laughs> he says this. Well, the whole audience burst into laughter. The minister next to me burst into laughter. The minister with a stopwatch, and everybody was bursting with it because Jesus was playing with the time idea, showing us we don't need to be so attached to time and rules. And I, I always know Jesus is going to use whatever the situation is for lightness, for joy, for happiness. As long as I have no investment in anything, I can experience it with Jesus. But if I have an investment of the outcome based on time beliefs or expectations, whatever, then I'm not going to be happy. I'm going to be stirred up. So that's part of what we focus on so much. It's not just a group of people spending time together, but it's, it's the purpose, it's the prayer underneath that is so important.